We're going to continue our progression with foundations this morning. Um, I felt very impressed upon during my preparation to incorporate this with um, the class we had yesterday for our evangelism, which is to begin very soon. So I'm going to build on, last week we, I spoke on the unbroken chain of salvation, and I'm just going to incorporate another link kind of links the other links all together. <laughs> and we're going to be talking this morning um, from, from the subject of not ashamed of the gospel. So if you will take your words and follow me to the, again to the first chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 1. Romans the first chapter. I'm going to start reading at verse 15 through verse 17. Again, we're in the first chapter of the epistle to the Romans. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 15 of chapter 1, it reads from the New English Translation Bible, Thus I am eager or may say, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. From faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous by faith will live. So Father, I again just come before you and ask that the words I speak be the words that you have directed me to speak, that I not speak of my own accord, but that I speak all that you have commanded in the truth and not deviating from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this passage of Romans, again, as, as I said on the, at the beginning, I'm going to um, relate to our evangelism, which is beginning. But this is also very um, fundamental as far as <clears throat> understanding the principles of salvation. And now that we have had a, a, a thorough review of justification, of sanctification, of, of glorification, and, and the very, very first foundations class was dealing with the gospel and, and, and what, it, what it is and what it takes and what it requires of us and what, it, you know, what, it, what is all entailed with that. And so I'm going to take that one, just one more link of that chain and group these together even a little bit more. So getting into our verses here, uh, beginning at verse... Uh, well, I'm going to actually hit on verse 16 first, but the very first things that he says is that Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel. And he also communicates the fact that he is very loyal and confident in that very gospel. And this morning, I'm just going to suggest to you um, that Paul's demonstration of his complete commitment and confidence in this gospel to the point that he's not ashamed is actually a principle that we can apply to our very selves, not only in our own lives, but when we begin to share this gospel with others, okay? Paul's not shy. He says, I am not ashamed of it. He is ready. He is eager. And he is available to preach the gospel. Now, we understand that to a world that's hostile to God, to a world that's lost, this gospel to them is foolishness. The natural man cannot perceive the things of God because they're spiritually discerned, and so they're, utter, they're utterly, utterly foolish to them. But we learn here, just as he says, through the foolishness of this preaching, the power of God unto salvation, unto righteousness, is revealed. Okay? For us, who have eternal life in the gospel, as the scripture says, the gospel is in fact the wisdom of God and the power of God. And what he's communicating to these Romans is simply this. 
The message is that I understand that in the culture and in the times that you were living in, in this Rome, having being citizens uh, of the empire of Rome, this kind of gospel, amidst all the polytheism and, and, and all the other concepts and, and endless debates about their gods, that this gospel that God is manifested in the flesh and died is foolishness to them. And likewise to us, and I'm going to hit on this just a little bit later, we, we also have a similar set of circumstances when we are in the position to share the gospel when, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but we understand that the world that we live in, truth becomes relative, especially when it comes to spirituality. And um, you hear this a lot, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual whatever that means so uh, but we'll, we'll we'll get to that but let me uh, let me stay on track here also let me I'll, I will let you know that I have incorporated uh, a few points from our curriculum for the foundations class so I'm gonna have to be a little bit on script here so I don't misquote uh, the things that I have down here but y'all know I fly off script a lot so bear with me <laughs> but uh, let me uh, get back where I'm going here so we notice that in, the, in, in, this, in this passage of scripture, Paul does not imp, uh, explicitly say, I, you also not be ashamed. But I think the very implicit, the, the implicit nature of what he has said, um, as, again, is a principle for us. Because as he was not ashamed of the gospel, as he was confident in the gospel, we likewise need to have for ourselves this very same confidence in the power of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is, in, in earlier verses, the righteousness of God revealed in his son given to us. Okay? Um, a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ is not ashamed, and there is no shame in the gospel. Um, you know, though, I spoke a couple of weeks ago about when we were dealing with sanctification, how having this makes you not be a winner of a popularity contest, you know? We work in, in environments and we work with people that are very professional and, and, and good at their jobs and things. But when you hear their conversations, you know, and the things that they talk about, the, the natures of the things that they discuss, you understand that as competent as they are at their job, they are very profane people that we have to work around. And the temptation is to not rock the boat. Okay, we have to maintain an air of political, political correctness, which, you know, is one thing I haven't understood because how come it's okay for them to talk about all the things they talk about and, and, and are really shameful things that we hear day and day? And how come it's not okay for us to say, hey, you know, this isn't right? You know, we, we, we are accountable for the lives that we live. We have to give an account. Now, how come it's wrong for us to say that? But they can tell us what kind of bizarre behaviors they engaged in the week, weekend and night before, I've always kind of wondered, but let's move on. Um, first, a couple of things we want to look at. First, in uh, verse 1 and in verse 9, Paul calls this the gospel of God. Verse 9, he says, it's the gospel of his son. <laughs> so we're taking note and we're reviewing the fact that the gospel then again is not about us, but the gospel is his. Salvation is God-centered. Salvation is God-serving. <coughs> God initiated salvation, okay? And we have discussed this a bit at length. You know, he sent his son not to a people that were lovable, but he set his love on an unlovable people, okay? He, he mm, listen to this. The end of salvation, ultimately, and we talked about this a lot last week, is ultimately for the glorification of God to transform these vessels which were worthy of nothing but his wrath and his destruction and make them fully reflect God's glorification. All right? The comprehensive tone of this um, is from Romans eleven thirty six, 36, and I'll just read it here. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Man, so let's lay, lay this out just a little bit, okay? Here's the gospel. It basically starts first with an understanding that there is bad news, okay? Gospel means good news, but there is no good news without there being the presence 
of bad news. Otherwise, there's no distinction. Okay? So, we are created by God. We are his creation. Okay? He enters us into covenant with him. Okay? We owe him our loyalty, but we have rebelled against him. Okay? And, and, and because of this rebellion, we were since plunged into a life and a generation and an entire race of sin, misery, guilt, and destruction. Okay? In this state, there was nothing that we could do to help ourselves. And then here comes the gospel right in Genesis chapter 3. God says he will send forth a redeemer. There is a redeemer, as the song goes, Jesus God's own son. And he made the promise that he would restore mankind to himself through his plan of salvation. And of course, that is Christ Jesus. Amen. So the first point of the gospel, then, we need to understand is the gospel consistently and unwaveringly identifies Jesus as a Messiah of the Old Testament. He was prophesied about many years, at least 700 years before his manifestation on this earth. So we need to understand that as far as the Old Testament is concerned, Jesus is that prophesied Messiah. Okay? The second point that we consider then is, and I'm going to go through these a little fast because there's a lot of them. Um, I'm just kidding. The second point is, Jesus is the incarnate Son of the living God, okay? He has his eternal sonship, and if we fail to recognize who Jesus is as far as the Godhead, the sonship, we fail to recognize his ontology in our plan of salvation. His, if we fail to recognize his ontology as far as the plan of salvation, then we lose the purpose of the, the economic nature of the Godhead, where each, 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 the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all have a role in bringing forth our salvation. But when Jesus was manifested in the flesh on this earth, we have to understand that this was God who lived for us, who died for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It required a man. But this man could not have been one of us born into sin, shape, and iniquity. No, it had to be God's unique creation. Thirdly, Jesus not only lived and died, he was also raised again from the dead as a pledge of our hope and resurrection of redemption. And redemption, excuse me. So basically, Jesus accomplished the salvation in his sheep, okay? His sheep who were chosen from before the foundation of the world. All right? <clears throat> Excuse me. He died for them, which is us. He was raised for us. He did not make us redeemable. He redeemed a completely unredeemable pe people that can now never be taken out of his hand. Think about that. We didn't have the potential to be saved in us. He brought this to us, and now no one can take us out of his hand. I deal with a lot of people that like to argue the fact that you can certainly lose your salvation. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have the ability to take something in a way that I didn't acquire for myself. Uh, you know, how, how, how can you release yourself from salvation when you're not the one who apprehended yourself to that salvation? It was done externally, right? And then we deny the fact that Jesus says, all that come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. No one can pluck them from my hand. So now you have ascended to the power greater than that of Christ? No. Read your Bibles. Read your Bibles. All right, next. Jesus is exalted, and this is what is presented in, in, in Paul's gospel here. Jesus is exalted and was soon to come again to judge the world and complete the salvation program. Brothers and sisters, if you haven't heard, <laughs> it is finished. He has returned in glory. He has completed the program of salvation. And as we talked last week um, in, in, in great, great detail, when we die... 
we leave these earthly tabernacles, this body, we're not going to be in soul sleep waiting on. No, we're going to be a body that's apart from sin and full of glory that will truly and fully reflect the glory and righteousness of our Lord Jesus. Because, you know, if you, if you look back in your scriptures, you understand that the robe of righteousness that we're given, it's not made with hands, it's not man-made. It's Christ. It's Christ. Mm. All right. So, the gospel is all about what God has done for us in our predicament. But in all the presentations of the gospel, they don't stop with just simply telling us what Christ has done. Okay? They, they begin to press in on us. Because there is a requirement from us. Repentance and faith. Now, these things are, again, done externally. He will grant us a godly sorrow that works unto repentance. He will give us the faith that gives us both the ability and the motivation and the will to believe. All right? But listen, you know, what, what, it has to come in, excuse me, in response to this gospel. Look at Peter in Acts chapter 2 when he gets up, um, you know, that the Holy Spirit had, had come and they were testifying in other languages of the, of the goodness and the glory of the Lord. And, you know, he, he stands up in the midst and tells them, you know, these men aren't drunk as you suppose. But this is fulfillment of what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he begins this magnificent sermon outlining who Jesus is is what they've done to him but this, despite what they intend to do this was part of God's plan of salvation okay the gospel then cuts them to the heart to the point that they can only say men and brethren what shall we do and this is the pivotal point Peter stands amidst them and says repent Believe, and you will receive the baptism into Christ. There won't be a baptism of the Holy Spirit baptizing you into the body of Christ apart from repentance. And it will not happen apart from the faith. But you see, when we preach this gospel, and preaching isn't, in case you don't know, just standing up behind a block of wood and you know beating every now and then to make sure everyone has your attention that's not what preaching is preaching is revealing the truth of God through the scriptures to an unregenerate person's ears that God then sends them the faith sends them repentance in response to that preached word okay repent trust in him with all your heart that's the faith that's given to us so the gospel addresses us in our guilt and rebellion. A proper response then doesn't simply require us to accept Jesus. But, uh, and I'm going to get into this a little more, but, you know, we bow the knee before Christ. We declare his lordship all over us. We believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead. With our mouth, confession is made of Christ as Lord unto salvation. That's what it's about. That's what this gospel is about. Turning hearts that are hostile towards God to confessing him as Lord, believing on him, not a mental assent. Okay, I've received the facts. I've done calculations and the probability that the prophecies about Jesus, I, I heard this on Christian radio not very long ago and I heard it originally a few years back, but it, I just shook my head because the man was on there saying he became a believer in Christ after doing a probability analysis that all the scriptures prophesying about Christ, all coming true on Christ, made it impossible to not be a believer. No conviction of sin, no evaluation of his lost condition and desperation for salvation, but the fact that all the prophecies in the Old Testament regarding Christ, being fulfilled in Christ, made it, made it statistically impossible for anybody else but Jesus to be the Messiah. 
Lord help us. So, that is the gospel in a nutshell. And I'm going to continue a bit more. But let me just say this. No matter how the gospel is presented, whether it's one-on-one, whether it's prior in front of a group of people, whether it's, you know, whatever the environment we are presented to do it, it is, without a doubt, very offensive to our culture today. Let me outline a couple of things here, and I'm going to share some of the examples from our course materials. But first of all, our claim that Christianity is the absolute truth is very offensive to the world that we live in, where truth is relative. It is very offensive to say that Jesus is the way, is the truth. And that no man comes to the Father except by him. That is very offensive. You'll often hear, well, there's many ways to get downtown. There's many ways to get to Ohio from here. But there's only one way to God the Father. And that is through Jesus, his son. I'm reminded of Pontius Pilate, who thought he had Christ on trial, but it was actually, (laughs) he thought it was some, some, some sort of trial for Christ, but when confronted with the truth, the only thing that came from his mouth was, what is truth? And this is what we are confronted with, brothers and sisters, as we carry this gospel and have to present the truth that belief in Christ is the only way to salvation. No man comes to the Father but by him. That is truth. That is divisive. The gospel emerges, you see, from a biblical worldview. A worldview that answers about questions like, how did we get here? Um, What is our destiny? What went wrong? How can it be fixed? Okay. It sees a self-existent God who is holy other than his creation, yet he condescends to his chosen in his creation. Okay? Secondly, let me also say that we can ruffle a lot of feathers by our insistence on the uniqueness of Jesus. Okay? And what I mean by that is there are a lot of other religious figures. You know, you have the Muslims who have their figure. You have the Buddhists who have their figure. You have the Confucians who have their religious figure. You have your Taoists, your Shintoists, and all these other different things. And you look on these bumper stickers as you drive by cars. They have all these religious icons. You know, that say, uh, not embrace diversity, but... um, Coexist using each one of the, thank you, sister, that use each one of the religious symbols, put them all on equal status. But when we insist that it is Christ and Christ alone, suddenly, look at the, <laughs> the silliness of this. We are expressing love from the Father in heaven. That is expressed through his son Jesus. And if we say something like Christ is the only way. Guess what we're doing? Hate speech. Get out in the public forum. And tell them. Like Jesus said. In John chapter 8. Around 44, 46. That except you believe that I am. Echo in me. You will die. In your sin. Let me tell you what kind of reaction you're going to get. People yelling and screaming, throwing things at you. You think I'm joking? Try it. Come on downtown where I work where people stand out in the street and profess all kinds of things. You start begin, you begin starting to say that Christ is the only way. You may very well get hit with something thrown at you. <laughs> but Paul says again, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because he was thoroughly and utterly and by personal experience convinced that it was the power of God unto salvation. Who was Paul when he was Saul prior to his encounter with Christ Jesus? He was a person 
that authorized and probably by his own hands even killed, arrested, bound up believers in Christ. And God may gave him through Christ a 180. It was his life that was turned upside down by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a second thing I want to look at in this passage today. And that if you look again at verse 16, Paul goes on to tell us why he's so confident in, in, in the gospel, as I just said. It's because it's the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. It's God's appointed means of salvation. It is the instrument that God has developed in order to bring about salvation. But look at this, look at this, verse 16. For it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel saves not all, but all who believe. There are lots of people today that are Christians that say things like everyone will be saved and that call themselves Christians. And the world would like to believe that, you know, when you have to give an account and your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds and most of us will be okay and we'll make it in. But that's not what Paul's teaching here. It is a gospel to everyone who believes. And let me just say this, and uh, I, I've shared this before in other environments, but my understanding of this is that as far as Jesus and his work on the cross, his living, his unmarred, uh, no sin, perfect before God and man life, his living of that, his dying on the cross, his resurrection is sufficient for every single person through all the history of the world in time, it is sufficient to save every single one of us. However, it is efficient to his elect. So basically saying, I'm saying the efficacy is for those whom he has chosen from before the foundation of the world. Those who he has given the ability to believe. And I truly believe that, and I have to speak against some of these things I hear. I hear a lot of strange religious talk around me on a daily basis. I, I speak to these things. Some people like to say, well, you know, it only took one drop of his precious blood to save us all. And I, I had to say, if that were the case, Jesus could have come down from heaven on one day took a splinter off the cross, poked his finger, and applied it to everyone. But no, brothers and sisters, for his, his sacrifice to become effectual for those who he called, it took every drop. Amen. He had to live the life. He had to fulfill all that was written of him in the law, in the Psalms, in the prophets. That was the necessary offering, is what made him into the perfect and flawless lamb. And I guarantee you there was not a sacrifice in the temple days of a lamb where they took the end of something sharp and, and poked his right above his hook to get a drop of blood. No, the blood was shed. It required the lamb to die. Faith is a gift of God. And we understand that being reformed, that man's complete depravity and the bondage to the, of the will to our sinful nature is what must be overcome. Okay? And as I mentioned earlier, um, look, look at the second part of that, of that uh, verse 16, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Um, that is very intentional construction. Because if you, if, you, if you look at Paul, when he taught, he began in the synagogues of every city. 
He went to the Jew first. Okay? But then, after going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, it became apparent to him that God had opened the door to the Gentiles. And you look here, this, is, this epistle to the Romans, is, I just love this book. It's so rich and full of doctrine, but you understand he draws a distinction. It began with the lost sheep of the house of Israel and has been extended to the Gentiles. Next in verse 17, for the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel from faith to faith. It's just as it is written, the righteous will by faith live. Um, I'm going to start sharing this a little bit from the curriculum here, but the gospel demonstrates to us that by faith, and I have said this already, that by faith we then obtain the righteousness of Christ. And we will never understand the depth of the cost of that. We are such an undeserving people of God's mercy. It causes me to wonder greatly, you know, and, and, and I, 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 last week I explained my, the conclusion I, I, I came to based on what I have read, but I stand in awe just of the magnitude of his great love wherewith he has loved us. So, the gospel real, reveals the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So let's begin to transition this. Okay, let's now personalize this. Okay, our key to sharing the gospel in boldness, then, I would liken to our own fundamental understanding of how and why it is God's power unto salvation. So, basically, what I'm saying is the more we have understanding of God's power to salvation, which is revealed in His gospel through Christ the more bold and unafraid we will be. So we have to be, first of all, make sure that we have been apprehended, our own selves, that we are walking in the truth of this gospel ourselves. This is not something that we can do hypocritically. This is not something we can do powerlessly. You understand? This is God's gospel, and he has given us a privilege as to be part of his enterprise of salvation. We can't save anyone, but we can provide for them, under the anointing of God, the means of his salvation by giving them the word of Christ, by which, by his grace, he gives them the faith to repent and believe. But let us make sure that our calling and election is sure. That we are demonstrating that power, that transforming power in our lives. That we are now new creations. That we are walking as a new creature in Christ. God works according to his good pleasure. He uses various means and testimonies from the everyday common person who is a believer to the preacher in the pulpit to uh, writing and writings and documents that, that, that basically bring out the truth of his word, okay? And uh, we need to also, you know, I, 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 I consider this a lot, but some of us, we are like walking tracks, you know what I mean? We kind of deliver in kind of a stale, monotone, delivery our uh, Christian experience but I think where we need to find ourselves is not just a walking track but a living epistle mm -hmm. Amen. let our lives also preach the gospel along with the words we can't have one without the other so as I mentioned I'm going to share a couple of points from our curriculum and uh, bear with me here so first and foremost, we must consider and weigh this gospel that we are preaching. 
We sum it up in Jonah verse, chapter 2, verse 9, in which Jonah says, salvation is of the Lord. So let us remember again that this is God's thing, not our own. Okay. Uh, in this first chapter of Romans, the first four verses, Paul goes through and he just summarizes this gospel in the person of Christ and in the work of Christ and the work of God through Christ. And, you know, he, he, he gives, he builds on that very, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept. He just starts building and building and building on this. Um, he speaks then about the relationship, the sinfulness of all people. The justification by faith alone, not, not by the law. The fruit of saving faith. The sovereign electing grace of God and keeping his covenant purpose. So we frame this in the form of good news in contrast to the bad news. And I mentioned earlier that we are lost in a dying generation apart from Christ. With nothing in our future but eternal destruction. The Holy Spirit then applies the work of Christ to our hearts. And if you've ever looked at the Westminster, the, the shortened catechism, it says this, and I'll, I'll quote it, Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit, whereby convicting us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills. He does persuade and enable us to embrace Christ Jesus freely offered in the gospel. So then the gospel comes to people who are dead in trespasses and sins. And by the regenerating power of God's Holy Spirit, following him in accordance with his purposes in election. All right? So I'm going to read off just a couple of these characteristics. And as I said uh, we, from, from, from class yesterday, when we learned. Um, some of the things necessary in going door to door and presenting this gospel. Let me just lay out a couple of things here. And again, these are from our material, so it may not sound like me. Um, we're reformed. So not that we have our own slant on it, but we need to make sure that we have a, a right understanding of God's purpose and his sovereignty in salvation. Okay. So first of all, first of all, when we, pre we present the, the gospel, first of all, one thing we need to ensure is that we showcase, showcase the glory of God as creator and redeemer, generating an awe of him and a profound indebtedness <laughs> for his covenant mercies exp uh, expressed through Christ. Okay, so we come from the approach that this is of the Lord and is great and mighty and he has condescended it to our level covenantially through Christ. Next, um, this is going to be a bit of a mouthful, but display the logical flow of the gospel, moving from problem to solution, as well as the glorious illogic of grace, the non sequitur of God's love and the unlovely, and his justification of the ungodly. This is basically to say that <laughs> we can't present good news without first advising and informing someone who is unaware of the predicament that they're in, okay? Then the gospel is contrasted. It becomes good news. Okay? And it's not logical that God would save a race of people that are hostile towards him. But it communicates then the vastness of his grace. All right? Next. We're going to carry forth the overtones of God's sovereign work and salvation and the undertow of his purpose in election, which is initiated and ensured by him. And it is contingent upon him rather than our efforts. God is sovereign over all and over all God is sovereign. And if we believe that God is sovereign, why would we not or why would we question as to whether God has sovereignty in something as important as the eternal destination of our souls. Amen. Why would we not think that or not consider that? But again, when we present the gospel, they, these things may not be understood right off. Okay? It may not be understood right off, but we need to be coming from that perspective when we share this gospel must be communicated in ways that rely on the Holy Spirit, whereby we, receive, we see ourselves as spiritual midwives <laughs> rather than spiritual door-to-door -door salesmen. 
I, <laughs> I, I chuckled quite a bit listening to Brother Keith. <laughs> you know, these little invitations to confess Christ have more times than not resulted in spiritual stillbirths. We need to remember that. And I've said this before, excuse me, my throat's a little dry. I've said this before. We don't approach people and ask, ask them, would they consider inviting Jesus into their hearts? That's wrong and that's unscriptural. Because the truth of the matter is, Christ stands at the door and knocks. He is beckoning the lost to come to him. <laughs> Invite Jesus into your heart. Okay. <laughs> we issue a call, and I'm almost done here, not merely to conversion, but to discipleship as to the exercise of li living faith and fruit of the genuine repentance. As I said last week, um, you know, this is something when, if you are not willing to count up the cost and forsake all to follow him, you're not fit to be my disciple. People, and, and because of kind of current day evangelism, they, they have presented this as simply a get out of hell free card. Okay, you've been saved. We'll talk to you later. Bye. No. This is a change of ownership. You have been purchased. And if you've been purchased, that means you no longer belong to yourself or to your own will. You now belong to the Savior. Our lives are now lived to Him. I'm going to close with this statement. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit over time. God works as He wills. This should encourage our witness. People are not saved by our eloquence, our knowledge, or our charisma, but it is His work. But we have to remember we are privileged to be instruments in his hand in the enterprise of salvation. We need to remember that through its beginning, through its end, it is about him and what he does and ultimately is to his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you just again for your word, your word expressed through the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans here. We ask that these things which we have shared this morning take root in fertile ground and produce fruit in some 30, 60, 100 full. And let us ultimately be aware and, and continue to remember that this is for your glory, for the furtherment of your kingdom, for your word to cover the world as the waters clothe the sea. We thank you and ask that we continue to, to be bold for you and not ashamed of this glorious gospel. In Jesus' name. Thank you.